The aerospace industry is coming under increasing cost pressures. In commercial aviation, our airline customers are suffering from overcapacity and continuously falling ticket prices. The airlines, the engine makers, the airframe makers, component makers, and service providers are all looking for ways to reduce costs in order to remain players in this highly competitive business. Goodrich is no exception. As one of the leading suppliers to the global aerospace industry, we are aggressively driving cost out of our business through working as one enterprise and by applying strategic sourcing and continuous improvement techniques like lean manufacturing and Six Sigma processes. As part of our program to instill a low-cost philosophy in our people and in our suppliers, we have asked one of our business unit presidents, Ed Hart, to speak about the case for change in the aerospace industry. Before joining Goodrich, Ed was president of an automotive components company that underwent excruciating pressure from its global automotive customers. Ed describes how the automotive industry made cost reduction its top priority. And he uses a bit of humor to make the point that there really was no choice for the entire industry. The strongest point that Ed makes is that winning players in the automotive industry were those who embraced the need for change early in the game and aggressively drove cost out of their businesses while still healthy. And very importantly, the winners aggressively pushed and helped their suppliers to do the same. Across the aerospace industry, both commercial and defense, the same pressures are mounting. As our customers struggle to survive, Goodrich is challenged every day to meet their needs. And every day, the experience of the automotive industry sounds more familiar. Goodrich intends to be one of the winners during this industry transformation by maintaining our technology edge and investing in new programs while making cost reduction our mantra. Let's listen in as Ed speaks to a group of Goodrich employees about the case for change. We call this talk Aerospace, the Case for Change. There's an automotive precursor, precursor being that event that is identifiable before an earthquake. Uh, what happened in automotive is very much what's now happening in aerospace. We want to talk about that. The background for this talk is that it started out as a talk that I gave way back in 1998 to my board of directors as we were morphing our company. Now, this presentation has changed quite a bit since then, but the real driver for it was a talk that John Grysick gave back in spring of 2003 in a paper that he's written. I believe most of you read it, yes? Uh, that talks about where aerospace is headed. I sometimes call it the epiphany memo because it really was a summation of all the pressure he was feeling from all directions on his companies, and it, it caused John to move into action. We clearly believe that aerospace is going to see a similar restructuring, and we're determined to be one of the successful survivors and we want to prosper in years to come. In this talk, I'll use the term global sourcing. Uh, we use the term strategic sourcing within Goodrich. I use those interchangeably, except global sourcing is really meant to remind us that we can't stop at borders when we're trying to get best cost. Going 30 miles down the road sometimes isn't enough. I think most of you realize that. We also like to make the point that there is a link between automotive and uh, uh, aviation. Automotive is clearly in aviation genes, those two famous bicycle mechanics who were really physicists in disguise. The Wright brothers were bicycle mechanics, but they used automotive technology, bicycle experience, and, and made flight possible. An amazing achievement. We think there are a lot of lessons from today's automotive uh, industry that apply as well. The appliance industry holds some interesting history for us as well. In the automotive industry, as we started looking for parallels for what we were experiencing in terms of cost pressure, we looked back into the appliance industry now, this is just what you think it is. These are household kitchen appliances and things of that type. But there was a real structural problem within the industry. There was an overcapacity situation. And with that came an unusual set of circumstances in which we had people like suppliers and distributors and appliance sellers and the people who serviced them all making money, but the appliance makers themselves were losing money year after year. It was not a situation that could continue. It was not a sustainable business model. Suppliers knew it and everybody fought their attempts to reduce cost. Uh, that industry fought back in a big way, and as you'll see here very quickly, this is an industry that understands cost containment. A refrigerator today, you can buy a low-end refrigerator for $400. That's what it cost back in 1924, too. A little inflation in there, but that's an amazing achievement in cost reduction. 
very aggressive buying practices, massive supply chain rationalization took place, 80% of the suppliers disappeared. It's a pattern that continued in the automotive industry later on. The thing that we noted from all this in the automotive business was that the people who really won in this whole scenario were the people who were the early embracers. They're the ones who, from the very get-go, realized this is real, this is coming, we do not have a sustainable business model, we have got to change. About 1975, Detroit was in serious trouble as well. You had the imports, oil crisis, uh, there were safety issues, emission compliance, and a terrible overcapacity problem hitting the industry all at one time. So in 1980, you had this situation that looks very familiar to what we saw in the appliance world, and that is we had outside suppliers making money. We had the internal suppliers, people like Delco, a GM division, were reporting making profits even though their car divisions were losing money. Dealers were making money. The people who serviced them made money. Even people who auctioned cars made money. But GM was losing money. So was Ford. So was Chrysler. That was not a sustainable business model, not year after year after year, which is what we experienced. And we knew it. But I will tell you, we all fought it. In fact, part of the reason why I'm here today is a bit of contrition, because I was one of the people who didn't embrace, and I fought. And I learned after a very short period of time that's not the way to run a business. We really did have to get our act together and drive cost out of our businesses. In the automotive industry, GM is the one that took the lead. GM drove cost out of its suppliers in a very tough way. I'm going to talk about that later today. Now let me just jump ahead to commercial aviation, the thing that we know today. It had its battles as well. Remember People's Express came along, one of the first discount airlines? Then Southwest, still with us today. Deregulation, 1979, really impacted 1980 and beyond. The regionals, now 9-11, and a serious overcapacity situation that we still have today. You have a very undifferentiated product, and guess what? You have a very familiar looking pattern here in which suppliers make money, that's us. Engine makers make money, GE, Rolls, <coughs> Pratt. The airframers make money. Uh, servicers make a little bit of money, but the airlines themselves are hemorrhaging, just hemorrhaging. This is not a sustainable business model. We all know it. The majority of our customers are in Chapter 11. What's going to happen? Something has to change. And all we're asking you to do is agree today that any business model going forward has to be one in which everybody in the chain has profit. Not every company, but every segment of the chain. There will always be companies that don't make it, don't get it, don't, don't, don't go forward. And if you don't like that interpretation, how about if our customer's business model is broken, then so is ours because we can't sustain it. Our industry has a basic problem. Our product cost is higher than the selling price. And that's been continuing for a couple years and looks like it's going to go on for a bit more. It can't go on for long. But the truth is that this general condition is just a short-term view of a longer-term trend. If we take a look at yield, yield figures, and go back to 1960, this is basically the jet age era, you can see that prices have gone down continuously throughout that period. Uh, and should we expect this to reverse? I'll take a show of hands if anybody thinks this is going to turn around. I don't think it is, folks. And will the business travelers come back? Any, anything close to what we did before? You realize, of course, that what profits the airlines showed over the last five or six years, uh, and they were slim, were fueled by the much higher price, roughly 4x, that we pay as business travelers versus the leisure travelers. Are we coming back like that? Probably not. And I just insist that uh, there's no turning back on this. Prices will continue to fall. That's what our industry about, is about, giving better value in travel. So costs have to drop also. It took the Wright brothers five years to figure out how to fly. We're 100 years into the commercial aviation business, and uh, we've got a struggling industry here. And I would argue that if you take your time to go down to Kitty Hawk and read the bronze plaque there on the Wright Memorial, you'll see that there was a warning sign way back in the 1930s that we missed it. There is no shareholder value left in the airline business. The debt to equity ratio today is around 100 to 1. If you hold airline stock, I hope it's Southwest. But the others have a shot at it. And we're very much hopeful that we're going to see the airlines climb out of this pit that they're in right now, and we look for better years ahead. Let's take a look at what's happened to air travel. Been tremendous growth, I think we all know that. And you can see back in the 1980 time frame when deregulation hit the US and, and uh, with it, the beginnings of deregulation globally, we saw a tremendous increase. Yes, 9-11 cut into that, but we'll get back on a growth curve here. Profits, very unpredictable. This is the global profit picture, if you will. And of course, there have been some very tough years here recently post 
In the U.S. by itself, tremendous growth. Look at the growth we've had in airline revenues. Since 1939, that curve is. But if you go back there to 1980, you can see when deregulation hit, and you can see it start to take off even more steeply. But you know what? There hasn't been a penny of profit throughout that period. In fact, today, we have a total loss of $1.4 billion at the operating income line for all the U.S. airlines. That's since 1939. Not a good story. You can see where deregulation came in. And you all know that we've had a number of bankruptcies since then. In the 40 years before deregulation hit, there was never a bankruptcy. With all the turmoil, with all the change that was taking place, with the jettification of the airline industry, nobody failed. Why? The regulators wouldn't let it fail. When deregulation came along, there was no one to regulate health anymore. And in fact, they didn't know it at the time, but Boeing had really become the regulator for the industry. When the government stepped out, it was up to Boeing. And Boeing said, you want to start an airline? We'll sell you a plane. And we had planes everywhere. We have too much capacity, pure and simple. So today's losses have wiped out all the past earnings. We clearly are at a turning point for our industry. Take a look near term. The last 10 years, Southwest earned $3.7 billion. United lost $5.2 billion. I think you know that story, but just seeing it like this, I think, just adds to the pain of, of trying to come to grips with what's happening in our industry. And that trend continues. If we look at last year, uh, American Delta United lost $5.8 billion. Southwest earned $442 million and Southwest passed United as the number three airline in passengers carried here in the United States. Low cost carriers appear to be the future. We're gonna to have to learn to adapt and serve these people. We gotta prepare. Take a backward look, if you will, at commercial aviation. Here's a very simplified view. We had regulated protection for many years. We created this incredible miracle of air travel, and it really is. We have an extraordinary safety record. You can go anywhere in the globe, Prices are, are inexpensive. It's amazing. But all throughout that period, we were sowing the seeds of trouble that we're experiencing here today. Undifferentiated services. Same plane, same seat. You don't even own the seat. You just buy it for a short period of time. And frankly, it's the same. Does anybody really care what airline they travel on anymore? Probably not. Our travel agent doesn't. Airlines became very regulated in their management styles. Uh, frankly, uh, a style that, that doesn't serve us well going forward. We're going to see a lot of shakeup in the airline industry if it's going to go forward. Seats became a regulated commodity during this period of time, a regulated commodity. Think about that. And then deregulation. Volumes increased dramatically. Overcapacity arrived very quickly, and plunging ticket prices were the reward. We enjoy that as consumers, but it's obviously a problem for our customers. In the meantime, airline costs grew. Uh, labor, medical, pension costs, dramatically increasing during this period of time. And now the airlines find themselves in a position where they've got to reduce all their costs if they're going to survive. Net-net, they're going to pay less for airplanes and services. Uh, and I would argue that until you get capacity and demand closer together, there's going to be pain in all segments of this industry, all the way back through the supply channel. So you don't see any turning back on this. Well, lately, it's been said that we've been flying into a perfect storm. Uh, my interpretation of that is it's the economy, it's the Internet, it's the thing I call lingering death. That's Chapter 11. One of the unfortunate things about Chapter 11 is it allows struggling companies to continue on to the detriment of other people in the industry. And while I don't want to play favorites, I think we could all identify some, some people who could go and make things better for others. It may yet happen. Fuel prices, of course, have been a problem. The war in Iraq. SARS, all recently happening, and you, you've seen this chart, I think, somewhere that shows where traffic was last spring, headed downward at a very steep level. But that's a temporary phenomenon, and that'll be over. But when this is all over, we really do believe that, that you will see a completely restructured in, industry. Commercial aviation will not be the same. It'll be changed forever. By the way, what's the Internet got to do with the airlines? Well, I want to argue with it. It has a lot to do with the airlines' current situation. Anybody ever buy groceries online? Anybody ever do that? Anybody ever order groceries and have them delivered to your house? One guy did. Well, Webvan and Peapod were two attempts at a, a business model that said people need convenience in the, in the delivery of groceries. Order them online, they're delivered to your home. Problem was that the groceries are low, low margin business to begin with. Uh, when you sell online, you miss out on the high margin impulse buys that we all are subject to when we're checking out had costly delivery associated with it, and if you had perishables, somebody had to be home to pick them up. That's a problem. So the convenience was lost. 
And those companies, of course, did fail. What's a perfect internet model? I would argue airline reservations. You can't get much better than this, folks. And of course, I would ask how many people have ordered uh, tickets online before? Uh, that's about everybody in the room, it looks like. You get a direct connection to the airline reservation system. Wow, it's you right in there. And all by yourself, by shopping different services and different airlines, you create the effect of a reverse auction. You're looking for lowest price. And by the way, so are the competing airlines. They're on there looking at what others are selling tickets for, too. And ultimately, it drives ticket prices down. And you don't have delivery here. People come to the store, the airport, to pick up their product. A seat is a very perishable thing, much like vegetables, except that we overbook. And we'll try and fill those planes, and they do a pretty good job of it. But a seat on an airliner is fully commoditized today. Worse yet, this overrides the yield management system that's been developed to try and drive the revenue stream upward for the airlines and drive average ticket prices up. What it means is the internet is going to continue to put pressure on ticket prices. We don't see any turning back on that. Ask the reservation agents uh, how things are going with the internet. It's almost a dead business. I hope none of you have families in the business, or if you do, I hope they've gone on to other things. But it's just about over. This is a dying field, if you will. I don't see any turning back on this as well. This is called disintermediation, one of my favorite words, and it's hard to say sometimes. But what it means is killing off the middleman. And the internet and communications do that very, very well. Take Home Depot, for example. Once upon a time when they wanted to buy a product in the Far East, let's say, and bring it to their stores, there were a lot of people on the way uh, that touched or handled the product or the paperwork. Today, it's streamlined. Product comes right out of China in a container and goes to individual stores. This is called disintermediation, getting rid of the middleman. And it's about communications and transportation and putting those tools to work for you as a company. I think you would agree Southwest does that pretty well in their business. What can the web do for manufacturers? Well, here's just one example. GE Lighting put it to work. They set up a site back in 1997 to connect their suppliers globally. They've taken their, their procurement time down by 50%. They've taken 15% out of the overhead costs of the business. We don't know yet how we're going to use the web, but I can assure you, you should uh, expect something from Goodrich here fairly soon. The web can work for us as well. We intend to use it. I really don't know what the future of commercial aviation looks like. But how much can we predict? Well, if you look at the financial trends we've had, if you look at the FAA's forecast of where aircraft are going in the future, these charts are the fleet sizes here in the United States. And as you can see, the narrow body and wide body aircraft don't show a lot of, aircraft, a lot of growth, pardon me. But clearly, there is growth in the uh, regional airline segment. Uh, we don't see any change in that direction right now. Nothing indicates that's going to change. It's going to be a very different world out there. The things we can predict, though, are these. The airline is going to fight to fill their seats. And competition will decide what you pay for a ticket. That much you can decide for sure. Large aircraft demand, probably going to remain low for the foreseeable future. And we can predict, of course, that Boeing and Airbus are going to be fighting for market share, but in a smaller market. And they're going to get some new competition. Uh, one from my favorite place called the Mojave Aircraft Company. That's all the planes out in the desert. And the other one, of course, is from the, uh, the RJs. The